minus zero. All right, so let's start. So hi, I'm Brandon Mara. Um, I'm teaching as part of the core. Um, on the most important part of the core for you, for life, phylogenetics, because it connects ecology and evolution and genetics and all good things in life. Chaucer. Chaucer? Um, <coughs> it's a, so it's a very important area, and so we'll talk about that. Because um, going on once in, well, so I work on developing phylogenetic methods and applying them to empirical examples. Okay, whether it's species limitation or trade evolution or things like that. Um, can you go around once and just tell me your names? Orlando? Yeah. Chelsea? Alex? Sonny? Chelsea? Lynn? Lynn? Nicole? Todd? Tyson? Cool. Okay. And we have two guests for this section. Sarah. And Ryan's also coming. So these are geology students who are so drawn by phylogenetics, want to sit in and watch this. So, okay. um, if you have questions during the course, ask. We want it to be very interactive. right? The goal here is for you to learn. Right? Um, <coughs> so in the, the intro video you can watch later. So There's a you know, way to sell phylogenetics. Okay. Also, I record all of my lectures and put them online. So if you miss something, you can go and watch it on YouTube again. If you have a kid who won't go to sleep, you can show them the video. Okay, so <coughs> learning goals for this part of the course. Okay, so I want you to understand the broader evolutionary context of what you're doing, right? Where it's looking at you know ecology of lichen on one individual tree, or you know all of life, right? We need to have a broader evolutionary context of what you're doing. Okay. <coughs> um, I want you to. Um, know why why we build and use trees. Okay. Um, <coughs> how to sensibly read trees, right? So if someone shows you a tree, you will understand it, right? It's like if you're in a geology ge uh, geography department and somebody, hey, look, here's a map, and you're like, what's that blue squiggly thing? It's a river, right? That's how basic trees are for our field, right? So you need to be able to understand how to read them. Okay. How to sensibly build them. Okay. Are you going to be at the cutting edge of building new phylogenies? No, right? We are going to be at the edge of, if, if you have, have a need for a phylogeny in your dissertation, you'll know, oh, I'm going to go do some, some, some sort of likelihood thing and have an idea of how to start looking into what you should do. Okay? If you read a tree in a paper, you just say, oh, why did they do it that way? That's a bad tree. Let me go look for a better tree. Okay? So you can read the literature, read the literature and know what you should do next. Um, how to use trees, <coughs> right? You don't just build them for, for kicks, right? We build them because they, they, they serve certain purposes. So how do you use them? What should you, what should you be worried about when you do use them? Okay. Um, you are not going to learn all you need to know about tree building, right? especially if this is a big, big part of your work. Right? If you're become a systematist, you need to learn, learn a lot more. Like every field, you can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? <coughs> but you will know enough to know when to use these approaches. Right, um, <coughs> and help keep from making bad choices, right? And so the people here who will come out with you know studies that look at you know ecology of you know predation response and something. And if you're not looking at it phylogenetically, you should feel itchy. Like something's not quite right. There's something you're not doing yet. You might not know what it is, right? But you'd have a sense of oh, we should go talk to Brian or someone to see like what's going wrong with my study, right? Um, <coughs> that's sort of a big learning outcome. Um, we're going to do a mixture of discussions, lectures, pop quizzes, and various activities. Okay. And I run this part of the course through my personal website rather than Blackboard. So that way, as things change through time, um, but in, the, in the future, people can go look at the course again. Um, people outside the room can look at the course. Uh, you can look at past courses and get a sense of what, what, what's changed. Okay. Um, there may be pop quizzes. Okay. Um, they will count. Everything counts. So be ready for those. No pop quiz today. Can relax. Okay. Any questions about any of this? Okay. So the details of you know when did Felsenstein write the independent contrast paper, 1985 or 1987? I'm not going to ask about that sort of thing. Right. But what I want, do want you to be able to do <coughs> is know like why do we need to control for for phylogeny? Okay. And if you know that it's just did a paper by Felsenstein, great. Right. That's not the key thing. Okay. Any questions? All right, 
So <coughs> feedback. So the course is to help you, right? And at the end of the course, you can fill out a course evaluation form and say, you know, Brian had a bad shirt, Ben was nice on this day, right? It doesn't help you right now. So this is something you, want, you don't like right now, something you do like right now, you can go to my website and give me feedback, you know, same day. Okay? And the course has changed in response to feedback, because it's very important. All right. So <coughs> any questions about course mechanics? On the course website, I have links to some papers. It's a paper to read for Wednesday. Okay. It's more of a background knowledge. We're not going to go through a detailed reading of each paper or discussion of each paper. We're going to get them, give you some background so you can come in knowing some of the words and some of the jargon. Okay. All right, so <coughs> why do I do this? Okay, and Jane, you've heard a bit of this already. Um, Sarah, you have too, but you probably forgot it, so it's okay. Um, <coughs> so who knows what this is? Yes, nice. Um, while you're reading ahead. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> It's okay. All right, and so they. It's okay. It's recoverable. I guess it's on the other side of the room. It's good for you. Um, and so they make these galleries in the wood, right? And in that gallery, sometimes they have this fungus, called ambrosia, right? That they eat, or the larvae eat. Okay, and so just that information, you can learn a lot, right? You can learn like what species do they eat? You know, how fast does the fungus grow? How is the fungus transmitted from plant to plant? Right? Lots of cool ecological questions. Okay. <coughs> but what we did was added sequences for I think it was like three genes, four genes, right? And got a phylogeny. Okay. Great. So what? Well, this tells us lots of information. First of all, we can see. How would they change through time? So here's, you know, conifers, anisperms, ambrosia, they're like feeding on phloem, seeds, pith, xylem, so both what they're eating and what kind of tissue. So you can look at how that changed through time, right? They have a whole bunch of ambrosia ones here, ambrosia ones here, um, the anisperm ones, right? So you can now look at the history of these traits, right, as current distribution. We can also look at Origins of agriculture. So these beetles, you know, bring over the fungus with them. So the females have these special pockets they use to they store hyphae in. And when they arrive somewhere else, they get the hyphae out and they get or spores out and they can start, you know, a new infection. Right? Especially farming. Okay. And so you can see, did that happen once? Did it happened many times. So we can find out, oh, it happened many, many times on the tree. Something we didn't know before. Okay. Uh, we can get diversification. Right? So <coughs> we can compare two sister groups, talk about what that means in a little bit, but two groups that sort of act as the controls for each other, okay, and find out that those eat antisperms have more species than those eat conifers. Why might that be? Higher diversity of antisperms? Why would that make more beetles? More niches. Okay. So more, perhaps more niches, and so perhaps they speciate more or go extinct less, right? And so if you get this question of diversification by doing this with comparison, okay. sorry, asking questions like that, okay? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, those are three different specific comparisons. Oh, yeah. So this is this tree doesn't include all of the beetles because beetles have tons of species, right? So this is a sample. We can know that Spalatini has 192 species, but its sister group has species. Does that mean one comparison? Yeah, good question. Okay. We can also look at inbreeding. <coughs> well, some of these beetles um, have a very weird sex ratio. People have you know 19 female offspring and one male offspring. And the male looks funny. The male has this like these jaws and this fighting, squatterized head, and the rest of them is this like wormy, weak little thing, right? <coughs> um, and what happens is the male mates with the sisters, and then goes to the next gallery, 
fights off that brother, and then tries to mate with those sisters. Right? Um, <coughs> and this sib mating leaves a different optimality, just a different optimum for sex ratio than if you have this random mating. Right? And we can see that huh, it looks like it's sort of associated with agriculture. Right? And I can actually do formal tests of this to see does agriculture lead to inbreeding right? in these beetles. Okay? Um, <coughs> and you can think about why that might be. And so we can get all these questions right, by just sequencing a few genes and making a phylogeny. Before we can just look at you know a smaller subset of questions. And that's one of the reasons why. I, and so this is this is my first paper actually. I was an author on this paper. And this sort of thing is what you can do with phylogeny. It's really really cool for me. Right? It's like a time machine to go back through time. Any questions about that? Okay. <coughs> Phylogenesis is taking off. Right. So this blue line shows. Um, Phylogenesis increasing through time, right? So papers that have phylogenesis in them. And then these circles, like Venn diagram, is showing the overlap between different, different papers. So papers that have first evolution in phylogenesis overlaps this much, ecology in phylogenesis overlaps this much. Right? So if initially, phylogenesis starts off just sort of the pimple the side of evolution, and then now it overlaps and then we build the evolution in ecology. Okay, so the thing growing field, yeah. Then include the word evolution. Oh. Right? So this is a literature analysis I did. So it might be, you know, biases like that. But the point is that there are people, you know, these papers that are or black aren't saying, you need ecology, you don't care about content. They're using the words to do that for some reason other than to some sort of Yeah. Even this department, right? So here are the faculty in our department. And then we can colorize them based on, you know, the blue people use trees, the red people make trees, and the red people don't get to use trees. We're working on them. Right? <coughs> and so that's a lot of people right, in the department. Right? So this just shows why, you know, all these people find this, find this useful. You know, maybe you will too. Okay. <coughs> I've never ever seen a people smoke, so. Um, <coughs> okay. So if I already. Is sort of a question to show why you might need phylogenetics, right? So I said to you, all right, hemophilia. So lots of Europe, European royalty have hemophilia. You cut them and they bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed, right? Um, it reduces life expectancy. It's an excellent trait. Okay. So one question you need to ask is, what environmental factors prevent you suffer for hemophilia and royalty? Right. This is a good question. So would that select for hemophilia? And I could, for example, do a t-test or something, right? Where I say, you know, what's the incidence of hemophilia in royalty, what's the incidence of hemophilia in non-royalty, right? And go, it's significantly different. Yay, publish. All right, it must be something about being royal that makes you, your blood flow. What am I missing with this? That question. The question implies that environmental factors didn't select so mm -hmm. Right? But actually, you know, what, what was it? Relatedness. Relatedness. Yeah. Right? So all the European world here are breeding with each other. Right? Um, and so, <coughs> you know, this right here, there's a small breeding population, so is able to become fairly common in this small population. Right? And so, the reason we explain this is because these are all related and happen to become common in that related population. Right? Now, if we assume that they were all independent, we have this story of, like, oh wow, royalty causes hemophilia. Right? But they're not independent. This is a related set. Right? So you have to take that into account. Okay? Keep that in mind. Um, yes, here it is in text. All right, plant height. Okay. How about this question?
Is that an okay question to ask? Just, I take a look at the set of my plants, and then I take my tropical ones, here's my temperate ones, tropical ones are taller, bunch of stars. Good to go? No. What? Okay, so good competition. Could be the other mechanism. Good. What else? What else is wrong with this question? I say. Yep. All right. And so. All right. So you have all these complex factors. You click around to those two: tropical and temperate. Right. Even that is a contentious argument. Where do you draw the line? Top, top, and temperate. Okay, hey, what else? Yeah. Right, in the same way with Europeans, you have the non-independence because of relatedness. You could have the same thing happening here. Right? It could be that you know some clay does really well with lots of moisture, right? And so they occur more in the tropics and the temperate. They happen to also to be tall, right? It could be because that clay is being selected for being moist, you know, their moist abilities, um, and so you see a lot more of them than you should than at random, right? But the fact that they're tall is just some sort of thing that's correlated that's being carried on because they're, they're related to each other, right? Um, <coughs> and so, if you answer this sort of question, which we actually, you know, was published, um, you might need to take into account this non this non independence part. Okay, does that make sense? Exactly, right. Um, so if we find a situation like something like that, where I have the red and the blue one, and the red are tropic and the blue are temperate. Right? And I see um, <coughs> multiple origins of this, right? And I always find the tropical ones are taller than the temperate ones, and I say, okay, yeah, I can ignore the phylogeny of them. If I find that it's this, right? Then it could be. But sure, it could be that you know tropics lead to higher tight through selection, selection, competition, things like that. It could also be that you know bees um, do well with moisture, and they also happen to be tropical. Also happen to have pink flowers, right, <coughs> or whatever. And so we need to be able to control for that. And so we have, there are methods to do that. So it's not hard to do, um, but it's easier to not do anything, right, to not get a tree at all. That can lead to you making mistakes. You know, answer right. By treating your data as independent when it's actually not. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> first lecture to the learning outcomes, what we're going to talk about why phylogenetics? Okay. What is a tree? Okay. Um, what does it actually mean when I draw this thing? What, is that? what am I actually showing there? Um, some of the tree jargon, okay? your primitive thoughts about trees, um, why tree finding is hard, and then we'll have time we'll do an hour exercise to get you into actually messing with these things. Okay? <coughs> so the first part what I'm going to do is go through a series of studies that use phylogenies and show about why they're, why they're bothering to do it. What, what, what's the value added? Okay. <coughs> so here's a study looking at species invasion. 
function of life history traits, right? So why do some species invasive? It could be because they are greater than others, it could be because they're generalists, it could be because they have a bigger body mass, right? <coughs> and this study looked at that, right? Um, but they have to, they did it in a way that took into account this non this non independence thing. Right? They want to know if everything is like this, they may not have a lot of data. If it's like this, they would be very confident that whatever trait keeps occurring in invasives matters. Right? So that's what they did in this study. And also, oops, you'll learn by the end of the semester how they did this. Okay, here's sort of a one, one picture of use case. Right? You can see um, there's some significance here for brain size. Okay, and what this costs you is one degree of freedom, like one data point. So it's not a big cost to take this into account, but it helps prevent people like me from nagging you and review your papers. Okay, it might also prevent you getting the wrong answer. I'll show you an example later in the semester where some where people did analysis and they showed that if they'd done it without phylogenetics, would have gotten the wrong answer or something. Okay, so paper number one, sold it all. Paper in science, problems to deal with non-independence. Okay. <coughs> There's another paper, and they took um, some bacteria and they looked along their genome and they applied it to each part of the genome. Okay. What they're looking at was bacteria will find some tasty DNA in the environment, pick it up, and start using it. Right? And they want to see how often this, this was done and in what contexts. <coughs> and so they used a lot of things to figure out some sort of structure like this. We have Diverging, then the structure, the structure. Okay, so you look at you know adaptive gene flow between these asexual bacteria using those phylogenetic methods. Okay, and that was a paper also in science. Okay, and there they did what we were doing was just inferring the tree basically, so just figuring out what the tree is for these sections of the genome. <coughs> okay, super soldier ants. Ants, get some super ants. Nice big head for killing the plants. Um, <coughs> and so, what they do is look for a genetic pathway that allows you to induce super soldiers. That occurs here, here, and here. To figure out um, if you can naturally or if you can induce the induction of some super stimulants. So, to figure out, you know, here we gain this ability. Here we stop expressing it because of the potential. And here we get we gain that ability again. Okay, so we look at this history of this trait appearing, disappearing through time. Okay? So given a tree, you can look at how traits change on the tree. Okay? It's also a science paper. This is looking at the ancestral states. Okay? So what is the, what, what did your ancestor have? What did it look like? <coughs> okay? In the paper, you can also do science. Um, we have a from med genomes. So, an uncultured class of green, uh, very archaeota. Right? So, there's lots of stuff swimming in the ocean. That's when you go swimming and stuff, viruses and bacteria all crawling all over you, of course. Right? And a lot of it was too small to be cultured, either too small to be picked up by filters or it wouldn't be cultured in the lab. Right? And so, what they do is just sequence the heck out of everything in the ocean, clump it, and figure out what they have. So, there, <coughs> Trees, right, to figure out what the stuff along the okay. So there they just did that by inferring a tree. Just making a tree. Okay. <coughs> Brown bear, polar bear, black bear. Right? And so people are fighting over you know the, the deep divergence between brown bears and polar bears, or very recent divergence. Right? So by this Polar bears are a kind of brown bear. And here, there's just such of them that separated for a while. Um, well, the kind of, so, which is true? Right? So, they feel like they're and now they think that there was you know, at least one harmonization of, of a mitochondrion in a brown bear going to polar bears. Right? And eventually, they think we should Polar bears have brown bear mitochondria. The nuclear genes can evolve in separate for longer. Okay. And so, this is only about you know, when they were made from brown bears and polar bears using this tree in France. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, 
So an example of evolution action. So we have uh, mind drain, uh, mind drainage, right? So the very acidic, you know, it's like leaking out of mines. Can bacteria evolve to deal with it? Yes. How did they? And so this looks at <coughs> how various transfers of DNA led to you know, bacteria that can tolerate living in mines. Right? It's a very ecological study. Right? They've been in mines for that long. Um, but even so, we can look, use these phylogenetic methods to understand how they're, how they're evolving, how they get these ecological abilities. Okay, so again, a science paper. <coughs> um, example, looking at you know, dinosaurs, right? So we know, we know that birds are kind of dinosaur. I'm not by now. I don't get it, right? <coughs> well, other dinosaurs, they have feathers or not, right? Was the Patosaurus covered with feathers? Was Triceratops, you know, feathered? Um, and what they did here is look at you know, a new fossil that defined these feathers. Right? We can reconstruct where feathers appear in the skylogy. Try to get at them. What's the T-Rex have feathers or not? Um, <coughs> that's a nature paper. Okay. Um, <coughs> what leads to adaptive radiations? Right, so we, we have talk, all talk about adaptive radiations. Any, any group you think at school went through adaptive, adaptive radiations, so definition. So that's definition. Um, and you can start seeing <coughs> how important are different traits. Right? Um, there's clearly matter, there's having high elevation matter. So you can look at this correlation across the many different groups on the logic and figure out what we see about the variations. You can find, you know, is it ecological factors, is it factors that lead to more speciation, is it factors that lead to lower extinction? Um, and you get at that using phylogenetic approaches. There's a nature paper, and again, looking at correlation with diversification. Okay. Um, how morphology evolves, right? So we have smooth muscle, oh, sorry, dryad muscle in midaria, so things like jellyfish, in bilateria, things like you. Right? It was thought originally that <coughs> those muscles were in once and they're shared, shared common character, but using evidence from which genes are involved in it, and what the gene pathways are, it's just it's actually evolved twice. So we use different, different genes to get at the same basic structure. Right? So we have an incidence of convergence. Okay. You can get it from using a phylogeny. Okay. So that was a nature paper. <coughs> okay. Um, here we see the importance of polymorphism and diversification rate. Right. So some birds look the same. Males and females look pretty much the same. Right. Nut hatches, things like that. Um, whereas other things like robins look very different, or you know, many ducks look very different. And so you might think, okay, maybe this dimorphism matters in terms of increasing speciation rate. Because right? so we have males that are brightly colored and dancing and squawking, whatever. <coughs> maybe females that species are more choosy. So if any sort of subtle change, maybe they don't interact and they won't breed anymore. Or just like, oh, you're, ma you're brown and dull, you're brown and dull, sure. But they might be slower, slower to have um, the reproductive isolation evolve, right? So we think that happens. So we can do a you know, test of this theory. And that was also an nature paper. Okay. And finally, I think this is the coolest, it's not something I do, but it's really neat. Um, <coughs> you can take current data on, say, a particular structure or a song or something like that you see currently, and you can reconstruct what that was back in time and then remake it. Right. So here, <coughs> they took this um, protein, reconstructed what the ancestral humans looked like. And then re-express it, see how it would have functioned. Okay, so we sort of resurrect these dead morphologies um, in the early work today. Okay. It's the same thing with song. We'll talk about this later in the semester. We'll have reconstructed ancestral songs of frogs, see how the frogs would have would have sounded, and they can play them back to modern frogs and see, oh, do you still find this sexy or not? Uh, and do, do actually behavioral tests on these fossilized, you know, frog sounds, which you can't get any other way but using phylogeny. <coughs> okay, this is from nature. Okay, and as you see, you know, all these high profile papers, you know, that use phylogenies to answer a wide variety of questions, right? So it might be relevant to your research for that reason, too, right? And I know I spend a lot of time, like, selling it, right? 
if any students learn better, if it's if you think it might be relevant to your own research. Right? But it's important to get on this. All right, any questions about that? Oh, so BISI, binary um, depreciation and extinction models. And we'll talk about those later in the semester. But it's basically a, a diversification model. You can say, does trait A lead to more depreciation or less extinction than trait B does? So in that case, it was, you know, sexually di di uh, dimorphic or not. All right. So, what is a tree? Right, so we draw talk about these trees, draw them, what do they actually mean? Okay. So here's life, right? So everything is integrating in time, and then pop and non here, some things here, and stop integrating, and then evolve separately. Called speciation. Okay. And then we show that on a tree is by you know A becoming B and C. I use oversimplification, right? All this complexity. And so on this tree here, you know, we draw it the same way, where we have you know, one species, two, one species, two, and so forth. Okay. Um, this creates a series of nestings, right? So you think about this tree and looking at it from above, right? You see sort of these two from the clump, right? These from the clump, these four from the clump, these four from the clump, these four from the clump together. These six when they come together, and we see the little clumps here. Okay? And so, <coughs> you know, which one of these has evolved the most? Well, they're all about the same, right? Um, but, you know, you look at, you know, how they're in. So, let's go over this one and this one. This one's relatives are all of these, right? And then all of these, and so forth. Um, <coughs> any questions about that? Okay. Now, here's a true history, right? Where you have you know, appreciation events, population size changing, pigeon progression, right? And then species can have some breeding, a hybrid event, probably being subdivided, a slow reduction in gene flow, right? And any complex things, um, extinction. That we typically just show as a single diagram like that. Right? And we're now working on more ways to communicate things like hybridization or the change in population size. Right? But 99% of trees you see when you look at this. It's a very simple structure. Okay. So why is D not? So. Right, you can quickly well put D over C, right? Um, if you're using a program that can only return a tree, then you get a tree back. Right. So even though the truth is, you know, C connecting to D and D connecting to D, most software will return that to you. So both will only publish. Uh, it could, it also depends on, you know, the support. I mean, how it's being inferred. Um, it's like, like parsimony, it's number of changes. But it, yeah, it's the way you can do it that way, or it's a distance measure. Because we're doing the gene tree approach, it could be that, you know, more of the gene trees went this way than that way, or the ones that went that way are better supported or something. So there's many ways to get it. And there are ways to now deal with that, though. So how do we get trees? We'll cover this more in a, in a week or so. Basically, you get your genes, right? You can get full them from a database. Make sure they make sure that they line up. So if I have one gene for you know an eye receptor, I'm looking at the same gene in other species, right? I'm going to compare the same trait, um, align those, and then infer the phylogeny. Right? So there's a whole bunch of steps of getting the data and processing the data before we actually start the inference step. And just to show you some of the, you know, we're going to get into the details of this later. I'm going to show you how level it will be. Okay. <coughs> there are different ways to infer trees. And people have had religious fights about this, like throwing chairs and crazy stuff about, you know, 
which methods to use. We'll talk more about what the methods are. But here you can see through time, the number of papers that publish trees, okay, and then which methods they use, and here which software they use. Okay. And so, <coughs> actually there's a lot of using parsimony. Okay. Just says we should take the, the tree that is the best tree that minimizes the number of changes. This tree says eyes evolve five times. This tree says eyes evolve two times. This tree is better. So going two two genes of eyes. Then there are distance measures, okay. um, purple, right? Whereas um, there's a way of clus clustering species based on you know, these species are most similar, they're most similar to other species, and so forth. Okay. Both of these are typical problems um, with certain species. And then there's a model of approaches. Right? We say, you know, I have a model for how DNA can evolve. Give me the tree where what I observe is most likely under that model. Okay. Or you know, use that model plus inquire information on those trees. Okay. Um, you get through all those, you see the evolution of the program, so it helped me a lot um, a few years ago. Okay. Most people now would use a few of these approaches. They might use, you know, elective approach and the Asian approach, or elective approach and the parsimony approach. Okay. Um, but some people will think you, you must use only parsimony or you must use only Asian approaches. And so there's some of those fights. We'll see you later in the semester. No, no, um, it's used less and less. Yeah. But yeah, but that's what doesn't count. Yeah. Um, we now probably mostly use is Braxanel, which are made in these tree trees. Yeah. And these are based on trees that are in tree base. So after you've built your tree and taken, you know, hours to months to run your analysis, um, if someone else wants to use your tree, you know, does she have to like email you and say, hey, can you give me your tree? Well, no, we have a way where we can deposit trees online. Um, so actually only 3% people do that. So it could just be you know, the elite 3% that use power. Everyone else just doesn't. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have some And we won't get into the programs very much this semester. Um, we'll cover a few of them. Okay. Um, this area where that's always changing. Right? So in calls and for a very long time, but, you know, Any other questions about this? Okay. So tree jargon, right? So jargon's boring. Um, but we need to talk, right? Because we can say, oh, look at that thingy there, and then the, the group there. No. Use precise language. Okay. So <coughs> a tree, also called a phylogeny, also called a cladogram, it has no branch lengths. Um, if you're a mathy person, you could call it a connected graph with no cycles. I don't think anyone here is that mathy. Um, yeah. Which is okay. Um, a taxon, also called an OTU, which doesn't use that much anymore. Also called a leaf, also called a terminal or a terminal node. You probably hear taxon the most or terminal the most. Okay. What are taxa? Well, they're often living organisms, but they need not be. Okay. So fossils can be taxa, right? Viruses can be different kinds of taxa. Um, people make phylogenetic trees of language, make phylogenetic trees of books, um, as it's going to get copied and modified through time. Um, we can make trees of many things, right? But for most things, we use excellent organisms. Okay. okay. Um, this is called a branch or an edge. Okay. I use both equally. Um, it may have length, okay, and the length is corresponding to time, amount of character change, probability of character change, okay. You want to figure that out from the context, okay. Someone might say, oh, I used, you know, rates to date the tree, and then the, the branch length is in our time units, okay. Um, and these matter a lot. So a lot of the approaches we we're going to talk about this semester um, involve basically stretching branch lengths to see is this trait evolving faster in this part of the tree than that part of the tree? Right? 
um, did the genes for brain development evolve much faster in humans than in chimpanzees and bonobos, right? That's basically what it, that was meaning, you just you take that branch and make it longer, so it has more changes on it, right? And that's how the test is done. So if initial, initial branch lengths are bad, you know, stretching something that makes no sense, that's problem. Okay. Um, that's an internal node. Okay. Please connect. We often do things at nodes rather than long edges. I'll show you that later. Okay. Um, if we have just two descendant branches, the tree is bifurcating or fully resolved or dichotomous. Um, nodes with more branches are often called polytomies or multicotomies or bad. We don't like them. Why might, why might we not like them? Right. So it seems like we think most speciation events happen one becoming two. Right? So polytomy could represent one becoming three or four or five. Okay. Another reason we have polytomy is that we don't know what the what the true answer is. So we'll talk about summarizing trees a bit later. But if I have this tree and you have this tree, right? We agree that D is sister to ABC. Okay, it's not the language it's sister to ABC, right? But what's sister to A? It's either B or B and C, right? So, you know, our trees don't agree. So we can say, okay, what parts do we agree on? Well, we agree that D is sister to ABC, but that's it, right? So we represent this uncertainty as a polytone. Okay? So it means we don't know something. We're scientists, we hate that. Right? So that's why we don't like polytones. You see the entry, it mean, often means someone hasn't, you know, we haven't got enough, enough data to know which is correct. Okay? Now note, this is missing some information. So we know that we don't have um, Right? This tree is a different tree from both of these. Right? We didn't get this tree. Right? But from the polytone, we don't know, we don't know that. Right? So there's some uncertainty here. It seems we're getting more uncertainty than the actual tree, how we're drawing this tree. Okay? So that's another issue. Okay? Basically, you can see polytone is, if it's actually due to something that we think is actually a legitimate case of one species becoming three, we call it a hard polytone. Okay? It means you know, no matter how much data you throw at it, in theory, you should not be able to resolve that, right? But if it represents uncertainty, in this case, we call it a soft polytone. If you just worked harder, you could solve it, right? Now, it could be that, you know, speciated, one speciation event, and then 10 days later, another speciation event, right? You'd be very, very lucky to get some characters changing there, right? So it might, in practice, be unsolvable, right? But we still think that, in theory, you know, it represents two different speciation events. Okay. okay. This is the root. Not all trees have rooted have roots. Okay, so a rooted tree, um, which is the most common tree you'll see, but not always. Okay, has a node that represents the most recent common ancestor. So we have to it as MRCA, most recent common ancestor, or LCA, least common ancestor, of all the taxa. Okay, and this shows the direction of time. Um, clade, okay, so something that most of you actually know do this year, right, so a clade is an ancestor in all its descendants, okay. Um, sorry, so that's a clade, that's a clade, this is also a clade, this is also a clade, right. Now, what's the difference between these two clades? So this one includes just this node in all its ancestors, and the other one includes part of the branch in all its ancestors. Right? But they're both valid clade, right? There's both an ancestor in all its descendants. So which ancestor you choose is different. Okay? So I can say that these three species, you know, kind of clade. Um, but 
but you don't know whether you just played or if you played. Yeah. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, the other things like paraphyletic groups, right? An ancestor and some but not all of its descendants. Okay. Um, there's also polyphyletic groups, right? Which is sort of even worse. So it's ancestor. It's meant to include the ancestor. Right? And I'm not going to emphasize the distinction between polyphyletic and paraphyletic because the same thing with tic tac toe. You can draw it as a polyphyletic group or a paraphyletic group. Right? But oftentimes you consider them bad. You don't like to use those terms. So why, might, why might that be? Why, why would you like to name clades only? Mm -hmm. Right. So I say great apes, and I don't include humans in that. You know, we're missing a whole part of the great ape lineage, right? Because we've missed, um, you know, the human part of that lineage. Right? Um, so one fun question you can ask people is, you know, are whales fish? Right? Um, so who says whales are fish? Two people say whales are fish. Gun intro bio, right? No, that whales aren't fish. But when you think about what fish are, so is a shark a fish? Yes. Okay. So shark, fish. Okay. Um, trout. Trout fish? Yes. Cow. Um, uh, starfish. Starfish, no. Okay. Well, that's a yes to that. Okay. Starfish? No. Okay. Who can draw a rooted tree of this? Exactly. So, thanks. so if you call a shark a fish and a trout a fish, if you want to make fish a clade, then whales are fish. And so are cows. And so are we. Yeah. Then you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, functionally, ecologically, they're fish. And cows are not fish. But then, right, so if you care about like, ecological funding, like predators, right? Predators aren't a clade. Um, parasitoids aren't a clade. Um, desert animals aren't a clade. So you could do it that term. You're thinking about it as, as a taxonomic group, right? Fish aren't a clade. And so you might think, okay, wow, we have <coughs> you know, this really interesting evolution of bones and trout, and also bones and whales, maybe bones help with the aquatic lifestyle, right? But actually, they just share bones from bones from common ancestors. And so it, you'd be misled if you ignored this shared ancestry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Right. Right, but reptiles, so like, so, what do you think about like crocodilian hearts? Partially chambered, right? Bird hearts, fully chambered, right? You might say, oh, isn't it interesting that like they both evolve hearts with you know more chambers than you know turtles have? How cool! Um, and it's happened both in reptiles and in birds. Well, actually, you know crocodiles are birds' closest relatives. Right? So it could have been their ancestor evolved you know partially chambered, and then birds evolved fully chambered hearts. Right, to be misled by thinking about them as 
different groups, and actually birds are part of them. Right, so you have to be careful with the paraphyletic terms. So, yeah. So, and people do fight about what you call reptiles, who birds and reptiles are not. That's how you know how to define reptiles, not that. Right, yeah. So now I mean, right, so now we know that the, what the root groups are. That used to be kind of controversial too, but yeah. I mean, the idea of birds being kind of dinosaur was controversial for a while. But we know that now. If you want to name a clade fish, then cows are a fish. If you want to name, you know, things that live in the water as a paraphyletic group, then you call a trout a fish and not a cow, and not a cow and not a whale. Um, but then you have to say, you know, fish are things that live in the water that are vertebrates that excludes, you know, tetrapods. Be clear. Okay. Other questions about this? Okay. Um, one thing we'll talk, about, we'll talk about this later in the last week, right? So we can talk about what clades are, right? What about what a genus is? Right. So one of, the, one of the big science standards is you know kingdom, phylum, order, class, I think all that stuff, right? Well, the fact is, you know, genus could be there. Um, should have moved around. Okay. Um, be called this a genus or these two genera or each of these genera. Right? As long as one genus is within another genus, you're cool. As long as the genus is within a family, you're cool. We you can be the only member of that family, that's still fine. Right? And so you might only want so now people will only name genera or families that are clades. And sort of the standard now. Um, it's not required that it's um, but you know at what level becomes a genus? That's something that people argue about all the time. It's like anolis lizards. I don't squat my time. Was a paraphyletic. Um, <coughs> you know, someone recently tried to split them into eight different genera rather than one genus. Right? Ah, oh, the tragedy of humanity. Right? And so there's this big fight about it. Um, but you can't go to a tree and say, "Oh, look." If there, as long as each one of them is a clade, you can't go to a tree and say which is right. Right? So it's a human construct. Right? And so when we compare groups, we often don't like to compare things like let's compare the number of genera in Costa Rica versus the number of genera in um, North America. In a, in a, you know, Tennessee, say, right? Because what they make genera in Costa Rica might be different from what they make genera in Tennessee. Right? It's sort of arbitrary human construct. So if you want to compare things, you can't compare those, you can't compare, can't compare families. Um, so what are you left with? So you figure a species, right? Um, and one thing you might want to do is compare sort of similar species, sort of do a twin study. So we want to compare what we call sister groups, okay? So, what does this mean? Head lineage, right? Head split, some speciation of men, and they evolve separately. Right? At this point, they're, they're the same thing. Right? At this point, they're so they're what we call sisters. Okay? Um, <coughs> and so we can compare, you know, this has red, that has blue, that led to some other change. Why might this be useful? Why may I want to compare these groups? Well, what, what, why use why, why compare the red versus blue? Why not compare these two versus these two? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you change. You want to compare those two? Right. Why do I want to compare this clade and this clade rather than this clade and this clade? Study, right? So I take two twins and I give one alcohol and tobacco and 
and see, you know, do you live longer? Are you happier? This is your other twin, right? <coughs> and I can do that for many, many twins. That's why we do twin studies, right? Where, you know, I mean, many factors that lead to, if I just gave half of this class alcohol and booze, half the class not, right? Well, you're different in size, you're different in age, you many confounding factors, right? If you're all identical twins, it's a lot simpler, right? And so if you do a lot of studies like this, where I take Okay. So I say, okay, like that beetle, beetle case, right? Those that eat angiosperms, are they more diverse than those that eat conifers? They the same up to that point, and they split. Um, and so the ones that eat conifers always have fewer species than those that eat angiosperms. And so they're happening again and again and again. Same way, I give the evidence that there's actually a pattern. Make sense? And so that's a sister group. This is also that. That's also a sister group. Right? Um, There's also a sister, sister group comparison. There's many possible sister group comparisons on this tree. All right. So rooting. So why do we care about rooting? Um, it tells something about the, the direction of evolutionary change. Right? So we have the phylogeny of ants. This is unrooted. Right? They can't tell you, you know, the ancestral ant is here versus here versus here. Okay? But what you can refer to is where they tried to root. Um, <coughs> and you know, looking at potential human places. Um, and the story you get about evolutionary history and social state construction, if you use this rooting, by inferring that the ancestral ant a large complex colony structure, and then that was lost in some of the small groups. Then if you were here, the ancestral ant um, had a small population size, um, and a small colony size, and then only they could get the complex colonies. Okay. Now, this is based on, you know, whether you're here or here on the street. So let's say here is um, simple colony structure, say so here is complex colony structure. Okay, so rooting properly can be important. Um, <coughs> so um, we have approaches for rooting where we might use, let's say, an outgroup. Something that I know, I know whatever the ants are, I know that a bee is not an ant, I know the bee is not a kind of ant that evolved, I know it's, it's something different. So I can say, okay, let's see where the bee attaches to this tree, and it'll tell me where the root might be. Okay. That's called using outgroups. Yeah. The other approach is two. Um, we know the, the root of all of life, right? Even though there's no outgroup to life, you know, it's a rock. Um, <coughs> we can do that using gene duplication and things like that. We also do it using um, a amount of evolutionary changes in groups. Right? The most common approach is to use outgroups for rooting. Okay. All right, reading a tree. So this is very important. All right. So here we see the question. We've drawn the all of them. Um, which of the following is an accurate statement of relationships? All right, so look at it and talk to your neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that was from last I forgot to upgrade, update it for this year. That's last year's. But looking at Henry Ambrosia, there's nothing nowhere later than Henry Ambrosia. No, no, that, 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 I was just messing with you. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Your retirement talk is say, you know, back when I was. <laughs> Alright, so talk to, talk to your neighbor about what the right answer is. And why? Talk, talk, it's okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, it messes up, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, one through four fingers. Commit. Uh, raise your hand. What, what's the right answer? Try to close your eyes and raise your hands. So that would change the distribution. <laughs> commit, commit, come on. All right. Okay. Sometimes, you know, you know, in science, you know, every new bright idea was held by just one person. Right. So if you're a minority of one, you might still be right. Like plate tectonics, crazy thought. It's right. You know. So it's okay. You know? Um, to be like the weirdo in the class. Don't, don't be afraid. You might be the right one. In this case, you won't. Um, <laughs> so, why two? Can you explain that? Yep, exactly. So think about I like that idea of the nestings, right? That, that early diagram by Hennig, right? So, these two share common ancestor, and then these three, and then these four, and these five. So after this split, right, there's a local change happening around here, and if these all share, they don't share with you know, so you have all this, this extra shared history. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, <coughs> any questions about this? Glenn's, you know, good to get into something that I'm apt to ask you a question about later in the final. I can sort of you learn something or not, um, which often people do. Um, Right, so, yeah. Ah, yes. Yep. So, so we often teach evolution as like, you know, we have, yeah, so we have red algae, and then you know, some of those still persist, and some of them change and are cooler, and now they're green algae. And now some of those are cooler, and they're mosses, and some of those became ferns. And a lot of people those became endosperms, right? And sort of that sort of chain of complexity, right? And when we teach intro bio, we will start with like, you know, sponges, and then, you know, more complex invertebrates, and then finally us. That's sort of thing. Um, <coughs> That's not really how evolution works. Right? So evolution is, you know, at a given time point, you have a species, and then it splits. Right? And it could be that this descendant gets lots of changes, this descendant doesn't. This might look exactly the same as this. Right? Um, but it's still evolving on its own from that point forward. Right? It could evolve something really weird, too. Right? Um, and then over time, <coughs> you know, this can then split. Right? And now you have a few more changes here, and a lot of changes here. Okay? And I'll show you in a minute about, you know, a case with um, animals where we show how we can reverse the tree and still get a, a different, different conclusion about this. Right? Um, but yeah, it's a good question. That's something that, that often, often this conception people are taught. But yeah, I mean, it's a series of nestings. They have this. You know, this ancestor is gone. Now we have two descendants, and one might look more more like it, but it's still different. Yeah. Other questions about this? That's good. So yeah, that's what you to make the easiest for me. Like with the green algae and the moss split, all the changes that were accumulated to make to get to the green algae are also in the moss lineage. Mm -hmm. Right. And they could have been reversed in the moss lineage too. Like could have you know. Um, Gained some certain features here and then lost some here or something. Right. But at this point, they were identical. Right. It's like, yeah, the node between, for example, the moss and the pine doesn't not the same as the moss. Right. The node between the and the moss and the pine doesn't have the moss. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and so as you can see, it seems that way sometimes when the trees are arranged. 
Yep, and actually, let me jump, let me jump ahead to this. This is, this is cool. We'll get back to the character stuff. Um, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, step ahead to this section. Right? So I often think about evolution like this, right? So if we're going back down from us, down through monkeys and then lemurs and then salamanders and, you know, boring or stuff. Right? <coughs> and so I often think about evolution happening this way. Right? Um, and that's why, you know, present it in textbooks that way. And so you often will see trees like this, right? We see, oh yeah, it's bacteria, and then it's lettuce, and then you have some fish, and salmon, and then you have right? Um, and so you often think of it as this increasing shade of complexity, right? Leading up to us. Or leading up to something, you know, if we like plants, leading up to, you know, redwoods or something like that. Um, <coughs> I can also draw this tree. So it's that. Okay. There we go. Right. <coughs> where I have, you know, a tree where Darwin is sister to, you know, a millipede, dragonfly, and a doctor, a copper. Right. So in this tree, the pinnacle of evolution is a copper. Right? And Darwin is some primitive organism. Right? Both those trees are valid trees. Right? Um, how can you reconcile them? So we have, you know, Darwin as the tip at one, and then at the you know near the base, so to speak, of the, of the other. Right? So how can you reconcile those two ideas? Yeah. Or the question is like, his ancestor here? Is it human or is it bacteria? So the things are still either raw, raw, and at the same time. So it's just you know, it's just Right. So again, it's a series of nesting, right? So if you think about, you know, that Hanegian diagram, something like that, remember? I could have drawn it, drawn it as same thing, right? Still have like, this bin inside this bin inside this bin, right? Um, and you don't say, oh yeah, stuff in this bin must be advanced, stuff in this bin must be the ancestor. No, they're the same time point. Um, <coughs> and the same thing here, right? All of this is the same time. Yeah. Okay. Well, has long as long to evolve, right? So the addition on the tree, when we tell you, you know, oh yeah, this is like this. Okay. Now we do associate reconstruction. We can see, you know, how we reconstruct things. Um, so if you reconstruct, you know, these things here, you know, okay, has legs, has legs, has legs, has legs. Eyes, eyes, has wings, you know, right? um, well, um, <coughs> so, um, you know, blooded, you know, yeah. Okay, and so you can't. So you can use a tree to get information about social states. You can just use simple position on the tree, saying, okay, yeah, we know that. This is the same as this. This is the same as this. This is the same as this. Even though we often teach that way, because I don't know, we're bad, but we shouldn't. Okay. Other questions about this? Okay. So people often call the liquid tree like this and call this like the basal taxon, right? Which is confusing because you know this is not a basal animal, right? This is another animal. This is not a basal. You know, Right. We say we might, we might tend to think that you know this has the primitive states, this has the derived states, and we draw a mixture of primitive derived states. 
Okay. That clear? Okay. Let's get back to stuff I just skipped. Okay. A little bit more about jargon. Okay. So characters, so homology, similarity to shared ancestry. Right. So humans, birds, and turtles all have four limbs it's due to homology. And I think that why we care about this is, first of all, it helps us figure out evidence for evolution, right? So we have this clade of tetrapods. Some evidence for that is they all have four limbs, right? Also, tells you what you have to explain, right? Like, it's like, oh, it's so amazing that humans, birds, and turtles all evolved to have four limbs. And what is something much really magical about the mechanical, mechanical advantages of having four limbs? Well, actually, no, we said evidence from our ancestor. It's maybe there, maybe it's has an advantage, maybe not. We only have one example, right? So not evidence there. Um, okay, homoplasy, similar but not due to shared ancestry, right? So, this is pretty similar, right? Um, but we had live ichthyosaurs and showed it to your, you know, your niece or nephew. You say, oh, it's a dolphin! No, right? Um, <coughs> um, live birth in the ocean, I mean, tons of converted characters, right? That's homoplasy. And that's cool because, it's, you know, it would mislead us about making a phylogeny. You might think, okay, has dorsal fin, has dorsal fin, it evolved once and it's shared by, you know, shared by the, by the descendants. So then this lead phylogenetic inference, but also, but also a very cool example of evolution in action. Uh, you say, oh, we know this, this version, you say, oh, this is what happens when you have a dorsal fin in the water. Okay. We're having a crescent shaped tail in the water. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip ahead, but the order here is off. Okay. So, plesiomorphy is an ancestral or primitive character state in reference to some other derived state. So, primitive taxa, you don't say. Primitive states, ancestral states, maybe. Right? So, you think, you know, the state here is ancestral state relative to some other change in that character here. Okay. A same plesiomorphy is shared by two more taxa. Right, so sharks living in water, right, the shared trait they have from their common ancestor. Okay. Um, apomorphy, right, a derived character state, which reflects with another ancestral state, so it's something that has changed later, right. So whales live in water because they're tetrapods living on land. Right, the ancestral state is living on land for tetrapods, and the derived state is going back into the water. Okay. Snake morphy is apomorphy shared by two or more taxa. Um, and that's cool. It helps us understand evolutionary history, right? So these two taxa share all these traits in common. Right? These are also unique ones. It helps us infer what the correct tree is. An odd apomorphy is apomorphy just by just one taxon. Okay. Note the correct plural here. More than more than one taxa. One is taxon. Genus genera. Please, please. Um, let's so. Okay. So we're gonna talk about talk on I think it's Wednesday about how to find a tree. Right? The first thing you get the sense of is like this is a really 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 hard problem. Okay. Why is it? So first of all, tree space grows crazy. So if I have just two taxa, there's one tree, right? A and B are sister. Now note that those are the same trees, right? I can rotate on any node. I can rotate on any nesting. It's the same. Right? It's the same tree. So whether it's A, B, or B, A, that exposition will take the information. And most of the trees. Now if I add C, where could C go in this tree? It could go here in the A branch into that tree. It could go here in the B branch into that tree. Is that it? Nope. It could also go on this branch into that tree. All right. So now I go from one to three trees. Okay. Um, the next step. But in D, I can add to any of these five places. Right? 
And we do the same thing on these, this tree and this tree. Right. Um, and so, and if I did that, then each of these trees would be different from each of these trees into these trees. So we go from one to three, three times five. Okay. Let's see where this is going. So I have one taxon, two taxa I have one root of every tree, three, three taxa I have three trees, four, three times five, five, three times five times seven, and so forth. Okay, this is growing double factorially. Okay, that's worse than exponentially. All right, so exponential growth, right, so we increase by, you know, two every step, you know, doubling, you know, the bacteria, you know, Ebola sweeping across the U.S. It's, it's doubling, you know, exponential growth. That's scary, right? Sure. Um, increasing tenfold each step, even scarier, right? If each infected patient has ten people who get infected from her or from him, and so forth. Huge growth, right? Trees, even worse than that, right? So it starts off at one, then three, five, seven, nine, eleven, keeps adding more and more and more. Okay. Um, <coughs> which means the number of possible trees grows very, very fast. Double factorial. Okay, so here's a log scale. Right? Here's doubling, here's going up to tenfold, and here's the number of possible trees for ten back to Here's the number of atoms in the universe, right? So there is, you know, a million to ten million species in the planet, right? Even if you just 45 species, species, more possible trees than our atoms. Right? So I could, like, you know, write down each tree I look at one single atom and store it somewhere, right? And by the time I get to the taxa, I have other atoms to store that information on. Right? So that's the, that's the space we're playing with. So when we, when we do a tree search in this class, this is where you're, this is where you're playing with. This sort of area where you can't even store all the intelligence you can look at. Okay. And yeah, note this is one million species. So imagine how many trees there are for that. Okay. So tree search, how do we search them in this crazy space? Okay. <coughs> so imagine tree search is a box of chocolates. Right? So how do we know, you know, what kind of chocolate this is? You know, is that you know, marshmallow or peanut butter or some crazy nut thing. I mean, how do I test that? Yeah. Eat it, right? Or at least sample it. Right? Maybe a core sample and maybe a bit. Right? I know if this one's better. Eat them all, right? So the way to look at this is by going around and sampling them all. Right? Um, <coughs> as a way you assess quality. Right? And I might start getting some um, you know heuristics, right? They might find out that you know, things have sprinkles on top, I really don't like. Right? So then I don't look at the sprinkle one anymore. Right? Maybe this company just sprinkled kind of cherry is perfect, right? I might, I might miss that one's wonderful. So it's based on, you know, sprinkles of peanut butter, and the ones that don't like them. The like cherry is amazing, and it's just sample because I have my right? Um <coughs> That's how we do tree space, right? So I have a tree, I want to say, how many changes happen on this tree? How many times did eyes evolve in this tree? How many times did DNA change in this tree? Well, you do that is by getting a tree and looking at the changes on it, and reconstructing those changes. And you can taste it by doing that. So, you know, we have this tree space bigger than the number of atoms in the universe, we can taste each atom. So it can be a while. And we can have heuristics that can say, okay, you know, stuff with sprinkles just doesn't taste good, ignore those. Or I, think it's a bummer. Right. or I could do some sort of similarity, where like, okay, okay, this one, this one, this one's a little better, this one's a little, so that little rounder. Another rounder one. Ooh, even better. Okay, let's try this one. Oh, no, 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 this time. I can have some sort of, sort of search across tree space that way. Okay. Now, of course, remember tree space is very big, right? And so <coughs> finding which one you want takes a long time. Okay. So here's a cartoon you can get now. Um, <laughs> so, finding an optimal tree is a kind of classic problem called empty complete in science. Right? And so, it's for problems where 
that we don't know if there's a solution that works quickly, right? And some people think there isn't one, but um, if you can find a solution, you can get a million dollars for a prize. If you can't be sure there is no solution, you also get a million dollars for a prize. The area where we don't know whether there's a solution or not, and there's pretty much proof on that. Okay. This comes up in, you know, try to figure out the best route to go from, you know, here to the grocery store to your friend's party. Right? That's a cost problem in this case. Right? Or <coughs> if you want to figure out you know, exactly how many you would have order to get exactly you know, five and appetizers. That's a classic problem in this set. Right? So there are many possible problems in the set. And the cool thing is that if you can find, find a fast way for one, find it for all of them. Right? Now it's very easy to verify you have a solution or not. Right? As I said, said to you, okay, one solution is fine if you're getting 10 sample plates. And you can say, no, that's not a solution. An idiot. Right? But I, I could say a solution is getting seven mixed fruits. Is that a solution? Yes. There's a solution. Right? There's actually another solution to this problem, too. At least one of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. So again, it's like, it's like tasting chocolates, right? So you find the one, you can tell. Right? You find one that's exactly you know, the flavor you want. But until then, it's very hard to, to look at each one separately. Okay? And that's why this, this, this characteristic of this kind of problem. Okay, and that's what we're, that's the problem, the problem we're typically trying to solve when we try to find out the best tree. The problem of this kind. You say, okay, I think there's a tree that has only three, thirty changes in it. Okay, we know that by growing different trees, we find it. Right? Again, there are heuristics here, so I could say, okay, I can ha have to have no more than you know eight of any of these. So I don't propose a solution that has twenty, and it's not going to work. So we can put bounds on it to make it work faster. Right? But still have to look at a big, big part of space. Okay. Um, let me skip this part. Okay. So <laughs> here's an example. So here's a tree that required 30 pieces of RAM to run. That's the nine. Right? It has 13,533 uh, species. Okay. Now if I added two species to it, Skip ahead. Let's look at how much more tree space is this. So, finding this tree, one out of you know, tree give, given 13,000 taxa, finding three taxa, is like finding the rubber duck somewhere on at UT. Right? Somewhere on campus, there's a rubber duck, you have to go find it. Right? Let's say that's how, how, that's how hard this tree search is. I'm going to add two more taxa. How much, how much bigger is the search space? Okay, now you're cheating. Right? It's like finding rubber duck somewhere on the planet. Right? So this little factorial growth, you know, increasing super fast. Right? And so at this point, even though adding one more tax on, makes the search space balloon even more. Right? It's like finding somewhere on the planet. Right? You can see how hard this tree search problem is. Okay. Um, another problem is just looking at the thing. Right? And so we'll see this in a minute when we start doing our analysis in R. Right? But Here's a tree that has 13,533 names. Your fancy HD TV at home has 1920 by 1080 pixels. Right? So are you going to put you know, eight names in a pixel? No. Right? This is a whole dot. There's no way you can look at all that tree on one screen. Right? Um, sometimes we'll tile many screens. But even so, it's still pretty limited. So what people still sort of use is using a laser printer and print out a long, crazy tree. Okay. And there are now also other ways to look at this that involve you know, dynamic scaling on a screen. So you can say, okay, let's look at this clade and zoom in on that clade, and let's you know, shrink these other clades. Let's go over here and look at the other part. Okay. There's no way to actually look at all the tree at once. It right, scales. Um, so that's sort, of the, that's sort of the introduction to trees. So the questions about that. So when you get into why you might want a tree, what you can do with a tree, why it's hard to get one, what hard you can look at one. Right. And we'll talk about solutions to these problems later in the semester. Right. So I mean, we can do this. So you know, we, we want to do it, and it's hard. But actually, we can do it. So it's good. Right. Okay. So let's do a little bit of R. So what I want you to do, I mean, again, you're not going to become masters of, you know, doing phylogenetics in this course. But I want you to sort of 
get a feel for how we do these things. That way, when it comes time for you to do it, you're not scared. And you get over like the basic activation energy to start doing it. So first, let's go to um, download the exercise for today from the website. So let me go. Okay, no link to get on this feedback form. Okay, so here's the R exercise. Let me use R Studio for teaching. I typically don't use R Studio, so you just use regular R, but teaching can be 